This program is brought to you in association with First National Bank of Botswana. Welcome back to First Issues. We continue our series on non-communicable diseases or NCDs with Dr. Kieran Fagat, where previously we learned that these ailments are the leading cause of death worldwide. In the coming weeks, we discuss diabetes, cancer and mental stress as some of the leading non-communicable diseases in the world. Tonight, however, Dr. Fagat discusses cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular diseases are diseases of the circulation and the heart. Uh, cardio means the heart and vascular means the circulation. So they're one and the same because they're part of the same system. So generally if you have a vascular, if you have disease in the tubes, you, you're bound to have disease in the heart. Likewise, if you have disease in the heart, you're bound to find it somewhere else in the circulation if you look hard enough. It's the reason why many diseases go together. For example, if somebody has cardiovascular disease, they're likely to have kidney disease. They're likely to have cerebrovascular disease, blood circulation to the brain, peripheral vascular disease, circulation to the peripheries. So it's, it's, it's one and the same system and, and, and the commonest uh, cardiovascular disease is that of hypertension, which is high blood pressure. It is the commonest largely because it is silent. You know, it is probably the most silent condition uh, amongst all the lifestyle conditions because it is, it is literally minuscule in the way it rises. It rises millimeter by millimeter by millimeter with time. Uh, the golden numbers are 120 by 80. 120 is the, the, the power with which the heart pumps and 80 is the relaxation. There's still a little bit of tension in that. It relaxes down to 80 millimeters of mercury. So 120 by 80 over years and years of research we know is the cutoff point. We know that the lower it is, the longer you live. If the blood pressure were to be 140 by 90, you know, remember we're talking about 120 by 80 being the cutoff point. 140 by 90, the WHO estimates you will lose 10 years of your life. Not now, but with time. So just that 10 millimeter escalation in your blood pressure causes these injuries in terms of the system. Because you must remember that that, that pressure affects the tiny little uh, arteries in, 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 in the heart, in the eye, in the brain, and gradually you see damage. Now with the technology that we have, we see on a brain image little tiny areas where there have been small strokes. Because the brain is very powerful, you don't notice it. Because you're aging, you, te you tend to ascribe it towards the fact that I'm aging, I'm tired, I haven't slept, I've been stressed. Um, I'm running from pillar to post and you put it down to something else other than the, the, the vascular system. And so in terms of hypertension, the key, and it's the reason why we teach our students, both nursing as well as doctors, that the first thing you do, I'm sure you're aware that the first thing you do, irrespective of why you go to a clinic, is that they measure your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you've got a headache, whether you, you're, you're pregnant, whether you've got uh, an infection, they measure your blood pressure. And it must be the same with all the other things we've talked about. People must measure their sugar, people must measure their cholesterol, just like we measure blood pressure. And that's the reason why it is one of the commonest uh, lethal forms of, of, of uh, diseases of lifestyle that we see because it comes off, unfortunately, where people come too late with heart failure, with uh, uh, stroke, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the issue is, is actually, uh, the question that we really should be asking, again going upstream, is why is hypertension rising? And that is, again, the issue of uh, the impact of lifestyle. You know, and sadly, again, this this sort of broken repetitive record. Um, I'm sure the youngsters out there don't know what a record is. Uh, so this 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 theme that keeps playing again and again is you are what you eat, or even you are what you eat ate. You know, if 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 the goat ate grass that was contaminated, you're going to get that contamination. So whatever has been in your system is going to cause a problem. You know, if if it's if it's uh, badly purified water, if it's you know, uh, a poisoned uh, system of agriculture, if it's too much pesticide, tox you know, toxins, these things get into your system. And it's the same with hypertension. It is primarily salt and lifestyle and, 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 and overweight. We know that people who eat too much sugar, we know that people who don't exercise enough, um, the cardiovascular system becomes lazy. You know, the, the, the arteries become blocked up, the arteries become stiffer. We know sodium or salt, sodium chloride, the thing you add, the table salt that we put in, we know that Botswana are addicted to let's why. Before they've even tasted the food, they're reaching for the salt container. So these are the habits that we see are gradually causing a rise in blood pressure and as a result, uh, the hypertension that we see. So how does cardiovascular disease present? What are the most common symptoms? 
cardiovascular diseases present as a result of various insults that occur both to the heart as well as to the tubes that come out, known as the vascular, the, the tubes, the, the vascular system. So um, we've talked about cholesterol, where, where if you eat uh, foods that contain a lot of sugar, which is converted to cholesterol, the cholesterol, as you can see on this heart here, has deposited on the outside here. Now this cholesterol primarily comes not from eating cholesterol, it comes from eating sugar. Sugar is more toxic than, than cholesterol, and sugar is converted into cholesterol, which is then deposited in the various circulation. So the key is not so much the control of cholesterol, it's the control of the sugar in the diet. So the cholesterol can block up the arteries, causing a lack of oxygen to the muscles of the heart, causing a heart attack, where you get this discomfort, which we call angina, which is the Greek word for heart pain. You get this, it's like an elephant is sitting on your, on, on your chest. And as a result, that, that angina is because the, the arteries are, are not supplying oxygen and the muscles are aching, if you like, and that ache is angina. Mm -hmm. I walk a short distance, I get an ache because my muscles are not getting enough oxygen. Eventually, this blocks and you get a heart attack where we actually have to rush you to hospital, give you something to unblock it, or we actually put a tube in to open it up to expand it. Now, this is all expensive technology, which we do have, uh, fortunately, in Botswana, but it's limited. Funds are limited, hospitals are limited in terms of access to managing of a heart attack. Unfortunately, often, because of lack of education, we see heart attack or damage to the muscles of the heart too late, where they come to our, our, our facilities, particularly out in the districts, where the, heart, the damage has been done, the heart attack has occurred, and the scar has occurred, the heart has begun to enlarge, and we call that heart failure. The symptoms of heart failure are fatigue. And again, unfortunately, people come late because they think the fatigue is because they're tired or uh, they've been sitting around for too long, they've not been exercising, and actually it's because the oxygen is not circulating around the system, so the body is tired because the heart's enlarged, and as a result, the power to, to, in which to pump the, the circulation is, is, is diminished. People notice their ankles are swollen, and they think, I've just been sitting for a long time, and actually the ankles are swollen because the blood is not actually being, being uh, drawn back because the power of the heart has been diminished. As a result, you get swelling of the legs. And if you ask a patient, you know, mauto arruha, they say yes. And then you ask them, they'll say, bobo holo holo. You know, and so as a result, we are aware that people come late because of lack of education. Um, <clears throat> so where else can it affect? It can affect the, if the pressure is very high with blood pressure, it can begin to stretch the tube that's coming out. This is called the major uh, pump of, the, of the, uh, the, the heart. This is called the aorta. And we can see the stretching eventually bursts. That's called an aneurysm. Where it bursts, you, you bleed, you die. You can burst in the, in, the, in the brain. These tubes can actually, the pressure can be so high, 100, 200, 300 millimeters of mercury can actually rupture the circulation of the brain, giving you what we call a hemorrhagic stroke, a, a stroke as a result of a bleed. Um, it can affect the kidneys. As the, as the pressure is transmitted to the kidneys, the kidneys have very tiny little blood vessels. The kidneys are damaged. And as a result, you get kidney failure. So the second commonest cause after diabetes of kidney failure is high blood pressure. It affects the vascular system, just like diabetes. Diabetes and blood pressure have, if you like, a fateful alliance. They often go hand in hand. We know diabetics are much more prone to blood pressure. We know people with blood pressure are much more prone to diabetes. The vascular system we talked about in diabetes can block as a result of sugar. The vascular system can be affected because the pressure is so high in the legs there, they can actually cause problems with hardening of the arteries. And as a result, they get this pain in the legs. So this is the way uh, this serpent, if you like, rides through the system, often silent until the end. I know you spoke of um, an aneurysm and a hemorrhagic stroke as some of the complications that may arise from having cardiovascular disease. But I want you to go further into some more examples and what other consequences there might be. With hypertension, well, hypertension is, if you like, silent, but the effects of hypertension are very, very singularly felt. And we see them in our hospitals where patients come with uh, the complications of hypertension. And if we just go through from, from, from the top to the bottom, we know if the pressure is very high, it, it can either cause a disruption in blood circulation to the brain where you get a bleed or the artery just closes down. So you get what is called an ischemic stroke, which basically means a lack of oxygen, or you get a hemorrhagic stroke where you're actually bleeding to the brain. And if you pick it up early, uh, in other words, educating people about what are the signs of a stroke, you know, weakness, uh, inability to talk, uh, dizziness, blurred vision, loss of power in the limbs. Uh, people need to be aware, they need to either call 999 or the ambulance or get to a hospital because these are the warning signs of a stroke. You wake up in the morning and uh, you notice your face is not symmetrical. You, you know, your mouth is pulled to one side. You need to be aware that this may be a sign of a stroke. You need to get to a hospital because we now know that if we do the brain scan early and we see a clot or we see a bleed, we can actually stop it. 
uh, from preventing any further brain damage if we get them within a certain period of time. Moving further down, we know that, that uh, in the heart itself, the pressure in the heart can build up and what happens is the size of the, 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 the heart begins to enlarge because it's simply like a hose pipe. If you put your finger over the hose pipe, the hose pipe begins to expand. So if you put your finger, if the pressure is high, the heart begins to expand. When the heart begins to expand, the valves begin to expand. So what happens is that you get leakage of the valve because the valve is supposed to be this size. It's now larger, so blood goes to and fro rather than going in one direction. So you get leakage of, of uh, uh, blood in the system which goes back into the lungs and you can't breathe because the blood is stuck in the lungs. So because the lungs are you know, so, so what we, we know all these signs are occurring and often unfortunately are disregarded. People just think I've got asthma or it's uh, it's the smoke or um, I, I, I'm short of breath because um, it's windy today. Or they, they, we, we hear so many excuses of the early signs of heart failure. And unfortunately heart failure has a very poor prognosis. If the power of the heart is reduced to less than 40%, the, 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 the lifespan is less than five years. It's often more toxic than many cancers. So heart failure is one of the commonest causes of death from hypertension. And we see it, unfortunately, sadly, in our, in our facilities. And by the time they come to us, we're again doing elastoplast therapy. We're doing patch therapy where we're giving a heart failure medication. We're giving blood pressure medication when, unfortunately, the damage has been done. And by the time the heart is enlarged, it's very difficult to reduce the size of the heart. We then move to the kidneys. And the kidneys are very sensitive little, little organs, which are the filters of the body. And as the filter begins to get strained from being pounded by this blood pressure, they begin to, be, begin to shrink because they're being, if you like, they're being boxed continuously by, by the pressure. And as a result, they eventually give up and you get, you get uh, kidney or renal failure. And we see many of our institutions which provide, fortunately, dialysis, both in the public and the private sector. Uh, patients, unfortunately, linked to these machines where they have to come two or three times a week to get their blood cleaned as a result of dialysis, as a result of kidney failure, until they await a transplant. And remember, we don't yet have a transplant program for, for uh, kidneys in our country yet. Um, and so as a result, we're doing expensive therapy for something that can actually uh, either have been limited or managed much earlier. And last but not least, the circulation in the limbs, we're beginning to see claudication, which basically means there's not enough circulation getting to the limbs because there's a blockage, because the arteries have been hardened by pounding that pressure down into the circulation. As a result, we see people who need bypasses of some of the circulation in the legs where we actually send them to vascular surgeons because there are blockages in the circulation. So this is the effect of hypertension alone on the system itself. Join us again next time when the good doctor returns to discuss diabetes. For now though, stay tuned to First Issues while we go for commercial break.